Hello, welcome back to the National Association for Primary Education podcast. And if you're watching this on YouTube, you're very welcome as well. Today, I'm chatting to Penny Borkett, and she is a contributor to our recent Primary First Journal. Um, and we've been doing a few of these videos now and, and interviews just to kind of get an idea of the, the people behind the articles and give you some sort of content and, and give you some sort of context and, and reference to what that is. So, Penny, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. So the article was entitled, Who Are You? The Importance of Building Identity in the Early Years and the Place of Culture Within This. So tell us, where did that come from and the starting point from that? Um, well, the, the title was the title of a chapter that I've written in a book, and I'll give the details of the book um, later on. Um, and the, the chapter explored not only... Um, identity within children in the early years, but the identity of early years practitioners and uh, where they came from and what it is that builds our identity as adults and what it is about um, the identity of children in the early years, what makes up their identity and why it is that it's so crucial within the early years that we think about those elements of identity with young children. So if we think about a young child's identity, it's about their gender, it's about their culture, it's about their faith, um, it's about where they're born, who they are. And it's really important that within the early years, we we recognise that. And I think it's something that as practitioners, sometimes we're a little bit frightened of acknowledging. Maybe that's because we've been a bit hung up about political correctness, but it's something that um, I think maybe Black Lives Matters in terms of culture has had, has had an impact on. And I think it's something that we really need to be acknowledging, certainly in terms of culture within the early years. So that's why I called the, um, the article, Who Are We? Because actually just who we are and what makes us tick, which is a big part of that. And I think awareness is probably a really important thing, isn't it? It's that kind of, we sort of, when we're young, we just do what we do because it's what we know. <laughs> and, and as you get older, you kind of sort of get that. But I think as the people in the education environment, understanding that and allowing them to, to explore it and, and to be aware of it is something which needs to be very, um, I, I guess the word is sort of purposeful in some ways in, in that very sort of supportive manner. Yeah, absolutely. And if you look at our curriculums, both, you know, within school, the national curriculum and within early years, the early years foundation stage, we have requirements to look at it. Um, but I think sometimes maybe it's easier to, well, not ignore it. We should never ignore it. But some some bits of the curriculum are easier to focus on than, than others. And, and, you know, I think identity and and particularly culture is is something that it's hard to it's easier to push aside and not to recognize and you talked in the article about sort of various governments and, and different points in history where the curriculum has obviously um been influential just talk us a little bit through that and sort of the i guess the good the bad and the ugly or, or certainly how these things have sort of been affected in the early years yeah so um well, the um, the early years foundation stage was um, was born, if you like, in two thousand and eight, and it's it's gone through a lot of um, a lot of change since that time. But the one thing that has has one of the principles that has remained within that is this idea of the unique child and that the, the, the um, the point that we should all see, we should see every child as unique and my view is that despite all the labels that we like to put onto children and I think we we live in a time where it's very easy to slap labels of special needs and and various different things on children but actually we should see every child as unique and 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 you know we should be building a curriculum that that is around each unique child um, but there is criticism of that and um, Lillian Ang has written a really strong piece that talks about how our ideas of um, 
the unique child are, are very westernized and very built around what we see in the West, but we don't really recognize the views of uh, families who come from outside of the West. So for families who might come from the Caribbean or Asia, um, you know, perhaps the curriculum isn't really built for families like that. And I, I really can understand that because I've worked in very multicultural areas. And in fact, when I was studying for my MA, my thesis actually looked at whether the Early Years Foundation stage curriculum was appropriate for a very multicultural area where the families didn't understand our preoccupations with play as a, as a, um, as a way of teaching children. Now, many practitioners might listen to this and think, what is she talking about? Because, you know, and I absolutely passionately believe in play as a as a avenue for children to learn but sometimes we need to we need to think about our families that we're working with and think of different ways to engage with them and that can be, it can be about you know really understanding their culture and where they're coming from and um looking at different ways of engaging with them. And I think sometimes the, the EYFS doesn't recognize that. And it, it does look at, look at the early years from a very Western perspective. And I think the national curriculum is similar. I mean, I guess the thing is, is it's, you know, these things are, are set by people in the country that they're they live you know the, like say the national curriculum is set by people from England or in the UK as they were depending on on the obviously the the new sort of de, um, devolved nations and, and they're and certainly Wales do, doing doing a slightly different thing now but I guess it really is key that it, that that is the case and actually unless we think of ourselves as a global country and are able to then think well the proportions of of different people from different backgrounds um and also wanting a, a sort of a, an, a a rounded educated person and a rounded educated environment because like i say someone living in in inner city is going to be different from maybe a rural village school but that doesn't necessarily mean to say that your sort of experience or your education should be limited to just your environment there should be a sort of a hand in hand understanding I guess that just what you see around you isn't the same everywhere and therefore how that works with you as a cultural identity personally is is very very important and how you then take that back into maybe a different world is also important. Absolutely and maybe you know when when the government's have their groups together to think about the curriculum you know they meet need people from you know from all sorts of cultures on those bodies that that, that focus on building the curriculum so one of the things which you mentioned there was sort of your experience with with, with different backgrounds tell us a little bit about your your professional um history because i mean that that kind of must give you a real sort of understanding in that really sort of global sense yeah okay so i've had quite um a very different career path really i started working as a teaching assistant when my children were young um so i worked in a variety of different schools mainly working with children with special needs um and uh, then I studied part time for a early childhood studies degree and uh, continued my involvement with children with special needs. And I worked as a portage worker. So a portage worker goes into the families of very young children with special needs and um, does various programs around play with the children um, before they're of the age to go into nursery to try and develop their skills. Um, and it was at that time that I started working in very multicultural areas. So I was coming up against families who really didn't understand the value of play, um, which was problematic in some respects because I was trying to teach their children through play and they weren't really understanding where I was coming from. So really having to think about how I could 
change those programs to get the parents engaged. Um, once I'd got my degree, I became a special educational needs coordinator in a Sure Start program in the Midlands. Um, and that was fascinating. There were 50 odd languages spoken within the area. And um, we were constantly thinking on our feet of different ways to engage the families that we were working with. Um, and uh, yeah, that was an amazing experience. Um, and it was at that time that I was doing an MA in inclusive education. And my fascination in cultural diversity really came to the fore. Um, and then um, once I'd finished my MA, we moved to Sheffield and I began lecturing at Sheffield Hallam University. Um, and I worked there for about 13 years and I've now retired and um, have written a book around cultural diversity and a book about special educational needs. And I'm just about to think, well, to write a book plan which might go to publication around identity. And what would you say is the 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 biggest thing around identity in terms of if you had to say look this is the one takeaway I'd like people to think about or be aware of that it's never too early to start thinking about it in the the life of a child um, I think everything that we do with young children should be about building a foundation with young children of inclusion so valuing them for every aspect of their life um, and helping them to understand that they belong and that they are um, yeah I'm going to use the word loved it's not a word that we use there's a, a lot of um, there's a lot of stuff that's been written around professional love in the early years but I, let's use the word valued in case people don't like the idea of the word loved in early years practice every child should feel valued for who and what they are and I think that identity is a huge part of who a child is and they need to be valued for who and what they are so that their identity grows and that they feel proud of who they are um, and you know, I think as early years practitioners, we need to really begin to understand that and work to ensure that we foster that we foster children's identity and we we support that growth of it. I really like the idea of, of fostering and that kind of encouragement of who people are. Um, and I'm just wondering, I mean we've talked about the curriculum already and and how the policy works within that but a big part of someone's identity is their expression of who they are and one of the things certainly as part of NAEP that we're very aware of is the narrowing of the curriculum or the focus on mm -hmm. on certain parts that is are deemed to be important and that in lots of ways is sort of counterintuitive to that, isn't it? Because if you don't have the breadth or the, the environment to allow people to express themselves in their identity, I know as a musician, you know, yes. my, one of my biggest yes. identities is the fact that I actually communicate the best in the world as a musician. It's something I sort of found my voice in a way that was different. And, and, and that started in primary school, mm. you know, and, and, and not having that breadth, I think, is really, is really kind of a, a damaging thing in many ways exactly in the way that you talked about from you know what mm. is my identity yeah and I guess for, for us in the early years that's slightly easier because we have a wider a wider curriculum if you like um, and we have that element of play and you can you know creativity and all of those kind of things come into that but yeah it is that we can we can allow the children to be who they want to be and we should be, allow that but actually with the new EYFS that's coming in I think there are more constraints being put upon us as as practitioners to think more about literacy and numeracy so some of those creative elements that were so that are so important to young children are beginning to be a little bit lost and that worries me to a certain degree because you know if, um, if we think about um, you know 
Afro-Caribbean children who love to dance and love to, to um, you know, love music. It's just such, well, it's an important part of every child. All children love to dance and love music. Um, and, you know, it, it's such an important aspect of all children's lives and we mustn't lose it. And I just want to come back to something you mentioned before in terms of, like I said, some cultures, the idea of play at school isn't necessarily something which they deem to be important or should be part of what goes on. How do you go about building that community idea in terms of of explaining that's how it is at the moment here or, or how it mm. is that we're, we're sort of teaching and but at the same time not sort of alienating the fact that just because we're doing this doesn't take away from what we see is your identity and mm. your culture okay so when, when I worked in Shore Starts we we um we quite often met this issue um and so um for my MA I did lots and lots of interviews with parents to try and, and not not to to blame them for not understanding why it was that they didn't understand play, but to try and look at, well, what did they think of as being play when they were younger? Um, and I tried to find out what it was that, that they, they um, thought of as being play. And it was lots of things around, they would make toys with their, uh, out of household things with their children, things like um, treasure boxes and, um, that kind of thing and they would make balls out of old socks and stuff them and that kind of thing and uh, so some not all of the things but some of the things we started to put in place in the shore start center so we'd make treasure baskets and that kind of thing with the pa parents and gradually we would we would start to make links with what what they played with us as uh, children and bring them in and they would be part of making those toys and making those activities with their children and it was a bit of give and take really so we wouldn't get obviously we wouldn't get rid of the the toys that we had in the centre but we started to also explain why it was that we used the toys that we had got and the more that they saw that actually behind our toys were things around counting and um, letters and, and numbers and things like that, the more they started to recognise why we use them. And then with us recognising why they use certain things, it was give and take. And, and you know, the relationships helped us to, to understand each other, really. And I think that kind of collaboration and, and community in, in, in its kind of largest sense of the word in terms of everybody involved in the child's education from the schools to the families to all the organisations around it's it is having time I guess because you need somewhere to go in order to have those dialogues that's not an email that's not a can you do this questionnaire can you do this it's about a real life dialogue and being in the same place and experiencing it um, and you've talked about sure Star. I guess that that was a place that really did support that kind of thing and something that we don't really have at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, sure starts were amazing. We did, we did an awful lot of good work there. Um, you know, sometimes we'd go in and work with children for three months and it was the difference. Um, I can remember a little boy I worked with and his mum was really concerned about his speech and language. And we worked with him for three months alongside a speech and language therapist. By the time he went into nursery, he was doing really well and his speech and language was up to what it should have been at his age. Now, that may have saved thousands and thousands of pounds of speech and language therapy later on in his life. So, you know, just that little little amount of money spent on my time has could have saved thousands later on in life and it's so short-sighted of the government not to recognize that but i won't yes. get political <laughs> no well I, I think your um um wendy scott is on our um yes. national council i'm sure you from my conversations with her you're very much speaking her language i don't want to put words into her mouth but, no we've had <laughs> but, conversations uh, but, yeah. about that <laughs> um and and, and um, one of the things that just struck me there is, you know, we're talking about identity. Um, and like you said, the measuring thing is a big thing across the entire education sector. Um, 
but you were able to measure by how your experience with that child changed and their experience and, and, and how they developed. Um, and I was just maybe think about the sense of the, the identity that teachers and educators have and people that are supporting children is you know not from a cultural setting but from an actual kind of professional setting you know that was measurable to you because you experienced it It was measurable to the family it was measurable to the child because Mm. it changed their life and that really is what we're here to do it's what we were about and I think just sort of broadening it slightly that sense of actually as a professional in education having the identity of being able to do that and that be the most important thing which of course is um is difficult in this day and age with all the data and and, and all of yeah, that kind of thing absolutely. that's needed but I, I i just thought it just seemed appropriate at that moment just to think about you know identity for all of us just mm. um wherever we happen to be pupil or or members of staff yeah and i and i think our identity is as practitioners never changes. I mean, my identity continues. Writing that article changed me because when I was writing my book, I wrote a chapter on theory. And I can remember somebody at Sheffield Hallam saying to me, are you going to be looking at critical race theory? And I was like, no, I haven't really thought about that. Um, And I think I knew a little bit about critical race theory and I knew it was quite a hard concept to get my head around. So I went for the safe options. I went for a lot of early years theory that I knew about and that I felt was safe. When I came to writing the article for NAEP, because of Black Lives Matters and for all of the the, the the horribleness of that, and because I'd been challenged by somebody on tactic that's the group that Wendy's part of um, I felt I really need to to delve into critical race theory and I was quite horrified by it I was horrified that somebody could could put that term white supremacy on me Um, but I had to acknowledge that I had I probably am guilty of white supremacy because if you look at critical race theory that's what it says Um, and that has put me on a a journey of real reflection on my myself and that's probably part of this new identity book that I want to explore that a little bit more Um, so I think my identity (laughs) continues to evolve through my life Um, and I think as as early years practitioners we continue to to change as we move through our careers and i guess that brings up the concept of the fact that there are two identities there's your identity which you say starts very young and should be encouraged to be explored when you're young and evolves through your entire life as you just explained you know that that's a very real thing but then there's the identity which people are putting on you based on whatever factors they are And, and that's an interesting mix i guess Yes, very much so. And uh, yeah, it can be, it can really make you think at times. I mean, that, you know, writing that article for, for NAEP was, yeah, it, it really did make me think in, in a way that I've n- never considered before, made me ask real questions of myself. And I thought I was a, you know, I, I, I suppose I would see myself as an an ally when it comes around. I like to I really like to ask questions about culture. I've got some, I've got friends from, you know, across the world. Um, and I thought I was sort of okay when it came to learning about cultures. I'd written a book about it, but I realized I'm not. And it really, it made me ask a lot of questions and I've had a lot of deep conversations since. Um, and we should just mention for anyone who hasn't obviously read the article, it's in issue 29, which is our most recent uh, journal. Um, and and just to finish up, um, what would your conclusions be having written the article and wh- where do you sort of find yourself uh, having been through that experience? Um, well, I'm still learning. I would say that. I think I, I will always be learning. Um, I'm be- I think I see identity as being even more important Um, now than I thought it was and I think I'm beginning I'm as I say I'm exploring writing another book and and focusing more 
are on it around gender, disability, um, and SCND a bit more, whereas more I'd focused focused on it quite a lot in terms of culture, but now focusing it on it in terms of different elements. Um, I still I think practitioners really need to to be looking at it more in terms of early years practice. Um, so I think that's what I would say. Well, Penny, thank you so much for sharing all of this with us. It's great to sort of hear um, the person behind the word, is, as, as it were. Um, and, and for people who haven't come across the, um, the Primary First Journal, you can actually get a free um, e-copy. It, it's a past journal, but it gives you a real sense of the, the breadth of articles which are in there. And to do that, you can just go to Nate dot org dot uk forward slash journal um just put in your email and we then send you um a free copy of that and if um if you want to become a member of nape then you get three hard copies a year um and it's full of uh, like i said a very diverse amount of articles and um and really insightful and thought-provoking and i think certainly for everyone involved in education if we can make people think and we can make people be aware and therefore they put the best practices in place to support children in that child first child centered idea then I think we're doing something positive so Penny thank you so much. Can I just give the details of my book? Absolutely please do. Um, so the title of it is Cultural Diversity and Inclusion in Early Years Education and it's written very much from um, for practitioners and students. Brilliant. Penny, thank you so much for being here. Okay, really appreciate your thank time. you. Okay.